Hi everyone, welcome to our fish physiology video. So by the end of this video, you should be able to differentiate between the physiology of jawless fish, chondriectes, and teleostomy, so teleost fish. Describe the different types of integumentary scales of fish. Explain the circulation and respiration patterns of fish. Trace the path of food through a fish and explain the function of each structure in the digestive tract and describe how waste is excreted in fish. So first, the hagfish and lampreys, the jawless fish, there's two classes of these, myxini and petromyzontida. You don't have to worry about those words. These are the jawless fish. So these are primitive, they're smooth and scaleless. They have a mucus coating that, check this out, this is the mucus coating of a hagfish, and it's actually studied widely for, it's being studied for uses for things like lycra, like a substitute for lycra. Um, I think it was being studied is um, for use in um, like bulletproof vests. So pretty interesting little byproduct of the um, jawless fish. These all have a cartilaginous skeleton, so no true bones. They lack paired appendages, so they don't have the pectoral fins or pelvic fins. They have five to 15 pairs of external gill openings, and they have really unique mouth parts. So this is a lamprey, and you see that they have this oral disc lined with teeth, and they're parasites, so they latch on, they suck nutrients from a host. This is a hagfish. They have two kind of two rows, so two dental plates. Uh, they're scavengers. They also have barbels. Those are sensory, so to kind of find, um, find food to scavenge. Moving on to the naptha stonefish or the jawed fish. These um, are what most fish are. Most fish do have jaws. And they have hinged jaws, which allows for a wider variety of prey. They have paired fins, which increases their stability, those pectoral and pelvic fins. So with those two adaptations, it opens a whole wider range of environments and niches that these, that these fish can fill. The nathostomes, the jawed fish, are separated into two groups also. The cartilaginous fishes or chondroichthys, sharks, rays, skates, and then the teleost fish or bony fishes, which are those that are on your list. But let's start with those chondroichthys. Um, these have cartilaginous skeleton. So again, sharks, skates, rays. These have really neat scales. They're called placoid scales. So this is what the scales look like if you look under a microscope, where if maybe some of you have had the opportunity to pet like a shark or a ray, if you go in this direction, nice and smooth, if you go back against the, the scales, it's really rough. These are teeny tiny little scales like this, but they're, they're pretty sharp. Um, this is a view of uh, what the scale would look like kind of in cross section. And it has this dentin spine. Our teeth are made of dentin. So it's almost like the scales of, of sharks, skates and rays are made of little teeth, little overlapping teeth. So skates and rays are bottom living. They have these enlarged pectoral fins that are fused to their head. And so it almost makes them look like they have wings, right? They have horizontal gill openings and eyes on top of their head because they're so flattened. The difference between skates and rays, if you've ever wondered, skates have a muscular tail and two dorsal fins and they lay eggs, whereas rays don't have dorsal fins. Remember dorsal is the back and they give live birth. So let's look here. Which is this, do you think? That tail is not very muscular and I don't see any dorsal fins. So this is a ray, a manta ray. Sharks, on the other hand, are not flattened. They don't have that pectoral fin fused to their head. They have vertical gill slits, five to seven. Most of them um, have live young 
but there's variation within sharks too. There's whale shark, hammerhead, great white. And then the teleost fish. So there's two classes of these, Sarcopterygii and Actinopterygii. We focus in class on Actinopterygii, but Sarcopterygii are important because they are the, they're kind of like prehistoric fish and they're the ancestors to um, early amphibians. So Sarcopterygii, lobe-finned fish, some of the extant examples are coelacanths and lungfish. Uh, they have muscular lobed paired fins. Um, so kind of a, they're a little bit of a link to the first land vertebrates. Whereas Actinopterygii are the ray finned fishes, um, like those that we're kind of most used to seeing. So for the teleost integument, integument what kind of scales do teleost or bony fish have? There's a few different options. Ganoid scales, these are, they're really kind of like armor. They are in our more prehistoric teleost fish, so sturgeon, paddlefish, gar. There's these rhomboid shaped scales that fit together. They're actually composed of bone, so they're, it's like armor. Whereas in, in most of the fish on our list, you'll see either cycloid or tenoid scales. So cycloid scales have a smooth margin. And my picture might be covering some of this up for you, but the tenoid scales have a, a jagged margin, like a um, kind of a spiky margin, comb-like serrated edges. These, it's a lot of times hard to tell without like um, without a microscope, but you can classify fish based on the types of scales they have. So we'll have some families on our list that have cycloid scales, some that have tenoid scales. There are fish that have chromatophores or pigment bearing cells. So some tropical fish are really brightly covered colored. And when you zoom in, like with a microscope, you can see those cells that have the pigments in them. And so that can be for a lot of different reasons. It could be for blending in, right, for camouflage, cryptic coloration. It could be for scaring away predators. It could be for mate selection. There are some fish also, there's actually 40 families of fish that have the capability of emitting light. So having these photophores, photophores are the light emitting cells. When we think about fish circulation and respiration, fish are unique because they have, um, they're the only vertebrates that through their whole life have gills and the only vertebrates that through their whole life have a two-chambered heart. So the two-chambered heart is less efficient than three or four-chambered hearts. It blood flows through the body in a single direction, a single cycle. So blood is pumped out of the heart, goes to the gills, picks up oxygen, then it goes to the rest of the body, drops off oxygen in all the body tissues, picks up carbon dioxide, then goes back to the heart and gets pumped again. Whereas in our higher taxa of vertebrates, blood returns to the heart twice. It goes and picks up oxygen, goes back to the heart, goes out to the body, goes back to the heart. So it's more like a figure eight. But for fish being in water, they're buoyant. It's okay to have low, lower pressure of pumping when buoyant in water. On land, without that buoyancy, you need the double pumping, the double circulation of blood. So single circulation in fish, very unique among vertebrates. Two-chambered heart, also unique among vertebrates. As for respiration, fish have gills, and you can see kind of the structure of the gills here. The gill filaments are, um, are like the fleshy part of the gills. And then the gill arch is the more bony part where blood vessels come through the gill arch. Oxygen is 
picked up by the gill filaments, then goes into the blood vessels to be brought to the body. One really interesting and important thing about fish respiration is counter current flow or counter current exchange. What that means is water flows over the gills in the opposite direction of blood flow to maximize the uptake of oxygen. And what happens is oxygen can continue being absorbed because it's always meeting with deoxygenated blood. The water is always meeting with deoxygenated blood because they're flowing opposite directions. And in the teleos fish, you also see the operculum, the gill flap. And what that serves to do is to consistently move water over the gills. In sharks, you may have heard, sharks have to keep moving or they'll die. They do have to have a continuous stream of water over their gills. So one way for that to happen is for them to move. They could be stationary in a place where water is moving though. So that's another strategy. Fish digestion. There's lots of different feeding strategies found in different types of fish. There's some that are filter feeders. Some are herbivores, so eating plant matter. Detritivores are like scavengers eating dead or de decaying matter. Carnivores are eating meat. So other fish, crustaceans, other animals. Omnivores eat a variety of foods. If we wanted to trace the path of food from the mouth out of the fish's body, it comes in the mouth. And then there's a pharynx and the pharynx is a shared tube between respiration and digestion, but then the pharynx splits off and for the digestive system goes to the esophagus. The trachea would go to the respiratory. Uh, so the esophagus, then the stomach, then, so the stomach isn't super well-defined in a fish. It's not like a, a big pouch, but um, where the stomach transitions into intestines, there's the pyloric cica. And what that does is excrete digestive enzymes. Then the intestines curve around, digestion's happening there. And right before the vent, which is the exit, is the colon. So the, um, the vent is the out part of the digestive system. For excretion, the fish kidney is, so kidneys are the excretory or an excretory organ, but in fish, they're pretty, um, pretty small. They're like an embryonic kidney of reptiles, birds, and mammals. The fish also has a relatively small urinary bladder because really they can pee all the time. They don't have to hold their pee, they're in water. Most fish excrete ammonia, some excrete urea. Um, and one interesting thing about fish is that for some fish, the tubules, the tubules in the um, kidney also serve for sperm storage. So a little dual purpose for some fish with the excretory system. And then it's important to note that freshwater fish and marine fish have different adaptations for excretion because freshwater fish, they are more concerned with getting rid of water. So maintaining a water balance so that water isn't constantly coming in and they pop, right? Whereas marine fish want to hold on to fret, they need fresh water to survive. So they're more interested in getting rid of the salt. So excreting salt. So there's different adaptations for both of those. You don't need to know specifics of each, but to understand that excretion for freshwater and marine fish is a little different. So take a minute and make sure that you can do each of these five, complete each of these five objectives. Differentiate between physiology, of agnathins, chondrichthys, and teleostomi. Describe the different types of integumentary scales of fish. Explain the circulation and respiration patterns of fish. 
trace the path of food through a fish and explain the function of each structure in the digestive tract and describe how waste is excreted in fish. So I will leave you with a fish joke. You ready? What part of a fish weighs the most? The scales. All right, I'll see you in class.